All right, hi guys, Ponder here. So for this episode, we're going to be going over factions. And the next episode, we're gonna go over terms. And then I'm gonna save light cones, relics, and enemy creatures last. I also switched up the music for immersion reasons. All right, let's get started with factions. The mortal being's speculation of divine intent is a futile endeavor akin to the irrelevance of a mayfly against the enormity of the cosmos. However, when individuals harbor a shared misconception, they gather as a crowd, giving rise to an added value. The formation of consensus, the transmutation of misconception into a generally accepted solution, and the attraction of the collective. Subsequently, factions naturally emerge. Regardless of the size of factions, they all interpret the will of the Aeons through their own creed. Countless factions also claim to be the emissaries of certain Aeons. Most Aeons have no interest in the movements of these factions, however some find it extremely amusing to watch these ants' feeble endeavor. Such Aeons may provide crafty guidance or deliberate misdirection to influence factions, making the factions the ripple through which Aeons interfere with the world. Though most of the Aeons remain distant, the vast number of factions have made the stars a lively place. They carry banners and flags, forming allies and foes fighting those who stand against their beliefs. The cosmos became a lively place indeed." Yeah, these factions only come about when there's like a shared concept or belief, and then when a certain individual has a certain belief, and then other people have that same belief, and then they come together, they form a faction. And even these Aeons are very distant and aren't really involved with the factions that follow them. I find it very intriguing that here it says some find it amusing to watch these ants feeble endeavor and they provide guidance or deliberate misdirection to influence them. I can only think of Aha the Elation as well as to some extent Nanook the Destruction in my opinion. So a majority of these Aeons watch their followers from a safe distance, knowing for a fact that some of them don't even care. Some of them misguide them just for entertainment or just to see what would happen. And also like this last paragraph, like when one faction disagrees with another, they go through a lot of conflict. And I think through that, the universe is a very lively place. And I believe there's 27 of these. Yeah, 27 indexed. 27 factions. Oh gosh. Like some factions are gonna decide to have conflict with one another and some factions are like, I I'm just gonna watch all this chaos unfold and hopefully our party doesn't get involved. Astral Express. Trailblaze. Choo choo, sit tight, no one fight, warp jump, watch your head, choo choo, seatbelt, fasten up, <laughs> buffet, car speeding up. Astral Express safety instructions from the pom-pom <laughs> pom version. So if anyone decides to join the Astral Express, pom-pom has automatically got you. After the fall of Akavili, the Aeon of Trailblaze, their trailblazing will was inherited by their followers, the Nameless, including the Astral Express that the Aeon once rode on. However, as the cancer of all worlds continues to spread, the star rails that the Express runs on also fell victim. The Express could barely run before the Blight descended, and had no choice but to run around when the rails became overly obstructed. It remained so for many years until a girl with red hair discovered the Desolate Express, Himiko. She was fascinated by the wordless stories the engine and the star rails had in store. She spent countless hours repairing the cracks and evening the dents, restoring the Express to its original form. The curious girl then set foot into the Express and began her trailblazing voyage that surveys the cosmos. Going off of the first paragraph, we also learned from the Aeon section of the databank that Akivili disappeared very mysteriously. Akivili, the Aeon, is dead, passed away, but we don't know how. It also says here the cancer of all worlds continues to spread. Stellarons are deliberately being created, either by an Aeon or some kind of power source. I believe we're gonna learn more about that in the term section, like uh, what, what a Stellaron is, and maybe how it's made, and why it's still continuing to spread, and I think it's the Nameless's job, or maybe the Trailblazer's obligation to figure out what's going on with the spread of these Stellarons in the universe. So after Akivili disappeared, the Express fell into ruin and got destroyed, and then later crashed onto Himiko's planet. I don't know where Himiko originated from. I don't think she tells us that either. But after the Astral Express crashed on her world, Himiko decided to fix the Astral Express. I don't know if she was the first person to enter into the Nameless crew, because we don't know how old Himiko was when she discovered this, and I don't know if there were other people who decided to join her, or if there were previous Astral Express members that, like, I don't know, passed away or left the Nameless for some odd reason. So I 
guess this is Himeko's origin story of how she was affiliated with the Astral Express. The Astral Express made stops at every station. With passengers boarding and exiting along the way, many join and leave the Express's journey. Like people come and go. The travelers come from different worlds, shoulder different burdens, and head to different destinations. However, while they are on the Astral Express, they would share the same voyage. That is why Himeko and the Express do not hesitate to open the doors to anyone willing to share this magical experience regardless of their agendas and intentions. So what I'm thinking is anyone who has come and gone through the Astral Express has always had a relatively good experience despite their background. Very welcoming. We saw that uh, when we first played the game, you know, from Himiko, March, Don Hong, Welt, and even Pom Pom too. Similarly, I think the family treats their guests with the utmost and highest respect as well. Related entries, the Trailblaze, Akivili, yep. The Nameless, and Interstellar Travel. I'm not too familiar with this. I believe that's a term we're gonna learn about in the future. But yeah, Astro Express, Trailblazers, the Nameless crew, very friendly, very open, very welcoming. And I'm curious on how many people have joined the Nameless, like in previous journeys. How many people Himiko has met. And I'm still wondering how Pom Pom came about. Next up, Stellaron Hunters. Not affiliated with anybody or any Aeon. This is the first faction of people that we meet in the game. Blade, Silverwolf, Sam. The four mentioned above, dead or alive. Do not hurt the Destiny's slave and do not let them lose their ability of independent thinking. A wanted notice put out by the International Peace Corporation. So they are for sure criminals, but to us, the nameless, they are relatively neutral, I want to say. Like, they're not inherently evil, right? Wait, it also says the four mentioned above, dead or alive, but there's only three. Blade, Silverwolf, and Sam. I assume they also include Kafka, but I don't know, for some reason her name isn't mentioned here. Also says, do not hurt the destiny slave, Elio, and do not let them lose their ability of independent thinking. So in this wanted notice, basically saying Elio is the mastermind of these Stellarod hunters, don't hurt them, and don't like psychologically manipulate them. Because Elio is a seer, or a prophet of some kind, being able to see into the future Future and know exactly what's gonna happen. So the IPC basically doesn't care about any of these Stellaron Hunters. Like, dead or alive, doesn't matter, you'll get a reward for it. Like, billions and billions of credits, by the way. And out of all of these Stellaron Hunters, Elio is the one you should keep alive. Because they are a person of high value. Knowing what Elio knows must be insane. In a quiet moment in time, the cancer of all worlds began to cause ripples across the stars like a rock tossed into a pool of water. Before anyone noticed, this twisted and unknown matter had already corrupted a great number of worlds, but resplendent and mesmerizing gems accompanied this corrosive mud, gems known as the Stellrons. Death and despair followed wherever Stellrons went. No kidding. For many civilizations who have experienced the disasters it brings, Stellrons are also symbols of destruction. <laughs> oh really? No way, Sherlock. However, despite the Stellrons' nature, there emerged the fearless few who travel between worlds to obtain Stellarons. They call themselves the Stellaron Hunters. No one knows anything about the Stellaron Hunters aside from what they have done. Which Aeon do they worship? What do they want with the Stellaron? With a cosmos filled with rumors about them, only one thing is for certain. Though the Stellaron Hunters are few in numbers, each of them holds incredible capacities and powers. These questions are still unanswerable, and no one knows anything about them except for their past deeds. We don't know their intentions. We don't know what Aeon they worship. So despite the Stellaron Hunters, being a neutral party. I want to say their intentions are evil. Like they want Stellarons that bring freaking disasters and destruction everywhere they go. And we also learn from the Myriad Celestia Japel Rebellion trailer about the crimes and sins that the Stellaron Hunters have done in previous worlds. There may be five of these Stellaron Hunters, but I heard from the game, I think it was from the game, either the game or some kind of Myriad Celestia trailer, that every single Stellaron Hunter has the power Power and capability of destroying a, a whole planet. Certain incidences. Silverwolf with Planet Screwlum. Also Silverwolf with her reality bending powers of like what? Aether editing, I think? That's the skill that she mastered that's able to manipulate reality. Kafka on the Gianzo. Also Kafka with mind control. Blade being Mara struck and having regeneration powers. Him going completely insane. Sam having a battle mech spacesuit. Elio with foretelling the future. Obviously these Stellaron hunters are a threat and are wanted by the IPC because of their 
many sins and crimes. In terms of story, I think they should be more involved. I know Sam's gonna be a boss in Pinacone, but I don't know why he's there. I don't even know if there's going to be a Stellron going to be implanted in Pinacone, but that will probably come at a later patch, along with the Everflame Mansion threat that's going to be implemented later in the Pinacone story. And Elio wants these Stellarons for some specific purpose. We still don't know that yet, but for a faction or a group of people who want these Stellarons, that can never lead to anything good. But either way, the Stellaron Hunters, they're mysterious, they're dangerous, and for some reason they can't be caught. Related entries to the Stellaron Hunters, Stellaron the Object, and Emanator, a phenomenon. Hmm, Emanators, you say? The Nameless, Trailblaze, mysterious strangers were seen to come and go in many worlds. Again, Fables About the Stars by Adrian Spencer Smith. A thousand years ago, the Aeon Akavili traversed across worlds, laying down the star rail that linked worlds together in the Sea of Stars and leaving behind countless legends about the universe and exploration. The brave and curious were attracted by the tales of these adventures and followed the steps of the trailblaze, joining the god on their journeys to explore the cosmos. The adventurers called themselves the Nameless. They rode the express created by Akivili and set off on thrilling adventures on planets connected by the Star Rail. Legend has it that Akivili, the trailblaze, loved journeying with mortals. They and the Nameless would share wine from various worlds, and sing songs composed by diverse civilizations. They would disguise the moving express as the trail of a shooting star and laughed at the people looking up in awe. However, they would often get into deep trouble due to their recklessness, only to be saved by the Aeon's power. Akivili formed a deep bond with their followers, and their adventures continued to attract travelers to join the ranks of the Nameless. When Akivili fell, a group of loyal Nameless carried on what the Aeon had started, continuing the exploration of the unknown. They held the belief that one day the will of Trailblaze will connect the entire universe. The Astral Express that once carried Akivili and their followers still hurries between the stars till this day. It is believed that the Express is powered by the heart of the deceased Aeon and is repairing with great difficulty the star rail contaminated by the unknown cancer. So Akivili and the Nameless being the very welcoming and loving individuals that they are, they would beckon anyone to join the Astral Express crew on their journeys. And based off of these descriptions, Akivili was someone who loved humans, loved mortals, sung and danced with them, even go on adventures with them too. So the Nameless believe that Akivili's will is able to connect the entire universe together. And despite Akivili passing away, Akivili's heart powers the Express. And Akivili showing much compassion for their followers, it would attract a lot of people to join the Nameless too. I understand that it would not be very ideal for someone to follow a leader or a god that doesn't care about them or doesn't really affiliate with them, unless it's like for power or for gain of some sort. But it's different with Akivili here because Akivili is not ashamed of being affiliated with her followers or even being like compassionate and very loving towards them. As saying here, formed a deep bond. Also this last statement right here, repairing with great difficulty the star rail contaminated by the unknown cancer. I automatically assume that's the Stellaron, because these Stellarons are spreading throughout the universe and they bring nothing but distraction and chaos throughout the galaxy. So wherever these Stellarons are originating from, it is Akivili's or the Astral Express's obligation to completely eradicate these Stellarons from the universe with great difficulty. Like it's really hard to get rid of these things because getting rid of the Stellaron on Bellabog was hard, getting rid of the Stellaron on the Gianzo took so many patches and that was pretty difficult too. I don't know if having a Stellaron within the Trailblazer really counts because instead of the Stellaron Hunters getting the Stellaron from Herta's space station, they decide to put it in the Trailblazer instead. And now that we're a part of the Nameless crew, trying to eradicate these Stellarons throughout the universe is more than uncommon to say the least. Related entries, the Trailblaze, Akivili, and Astral Express, Trailblaze. Gianzo Alliance, The Hunt, fight together against countless enemies, be together through endless turmoil. Of the thousand lifespans encountered, I take but one sip and leave the rest to its fate. From world's history as a mirror, Gianzo. In an ancient era of legends, multiple Gianzo ships were tasked with voyaging across the stars to search for the miracle medicine of immortality. Oh! About that. <laughs> the endless voyage took its toll on Gianzo, wearing away its conviction and shape over the long years until their eventual encounter with Yaoshi. However, all that the fruit of immortality brought upon them were sorrows, poverty, and endless war and death. 
It wasn't until Lon, the Aeon of the Hunt, returned from the Abyss. The Abyss? What the heck? This isn't Genshin. Why are you mentioning the Abyss? Using gravity as bowstring and stars as arrows, Lon shattered the Ambrosial Arbor and put the wickedness of abundance to an end. After Zienzo returned to the Righteous Path, it formed an alliance under the guidance of the Hunt and formed a powerful army known as the Cloud Knights. The alliance's goals were to patrol the world and eradicate all abominations of abundance and put an end to the corruption of the undead. Yeah, this paragraph pretty much much sums up what happened between the Xianzo, Yashi the Abundance, and Lan the Hunt. Xianzo ships wanted to look for a medicine of immortality, and then they encountered Yashi, and Yashi's like, yo, I got you. And then, haha, psych, sorrows, poverty, endless war and death. And then Lan was like, yo, you're messing with my people. I'm gonna have to fix this myself by destroying the Ambrosial Arbor and banishing Yashi and their influence away from my people. But unfortunately, Yashi is still alive, but Lan and the Jianzo are still on the hunt, no pun intended, just to hunt down Yashi and completely eradicate their existence from the universe. And then right after the Jianzo fix their problem, and as said here, return to the Righteous Path, they form the Cloud Knights, and we learn of that from the Myriad Celestia trailer with Jing Liu, as well as the Cloud Knights as well, I think. Over the years, the Xianzo Alliance landed on a great number of worlds that used to enjoy the grace of gods. They eradicated countless undead abominations. Any civilization that worshipped abundance had to consider the possible threat of the Gianzo destroying their planet. Oh, really? Dang. This kind of deterrence was precisely what the Gianzo Alliance is hoping to be. They want to be seen as the constant red line for those greedy for immortality, becoming the price that none dares to pay. To this day, countless souls have gathered upon Gianzo, all bearing the will of the hunt and the intent of seeking revenge on the ravaging abundance. They will not rest until the complete eradication of the deathless doom and their cosmic tours will not end. Yeesh. I did not know that certain civilizations and even planets would consider following Yashi the Abundance. And for the Jianzo to show up like, hey, do you follow Yashi the Abundance? Like, wh what do you think of that Aeon, you know? Um, <laughs> oh, you're a follower of Yashi, you say, huh? <laughs> well, maybe we can help you reconsider. <laughs> and the Jianzo's like, yo, Repent of your ways, completely unfollow Yashi the Abundance, and you can join us. Because we have experienced what Yashi the Abundance has done to our people, and also the people that are with us in trying to hunt down Yashi. This makes me think of the Galaxy Rangers, you know, also being followers of Lon the Hunt. And for Akron to be a Galaxy Ranger, maybe she has some business with someone who wants to become immortal, or maybe she has her own experience with Yashi the Abundance. Maybe that's why she's a Galaxy Ranger. As said here, all these people bearing the will of the hunt, seeking revenge on the ravaging abundance until the complete eradication of the Deathless Doom. That's another title for Yashi. So the Gienzo Alliance are on a constant, never-ending hunt for Yashi and their influence in their universe until it's completely done. Related entries, Lon the Hunt, Yashi the Abundance, the Denizens of Abundance, and the Cancer of All Worlds. Galaxy Rangers, the hunt, the ultimate fighter, dreams only of the stars, from world's history as a mirror. Not all devotees of the hunt hate abundance. Such a group of talented rangers exists out there. This group admires Lon's policy of using violence against violence and the Aeon's swift decisiveness regarding punishment, believing the benevolence and justice of the universe need to be upheld via personal action. The Galaxy Rangers formed into a group of heroes, walking the path of the hunt and roamed the universe thanks to the blessings of the Aeon. They went from planet to planet, upholding justice for the locals, hunting down evil, then embarking on new journeys. The successful assassination of a Lord Ravager, Zulo, that's new, first brought the Galaxy Rangers their fame. Oh, yeah, I, I completely... I read this from the last episode, reading about Pinacone's information and also some of the factions from the official Hoyo Labs website. And many years later, a ranger thwarted the atavistic experiment of the 64th member of the Genius Society, Dr. Primitive. But after that, these galaxy rangers gradually faded out of sight in the cosmos. Rumor has it that they fell victim to Dr. Primitive's vengeance. Yeah, so it seems the galaxy rangers and the Genius Society have a conflict. I want to compare these galaxy rangers to being anti 
anti-heroes for the local people. They're not for the people, but they're not against the people either. They want to fight against evil, but they don't really care for reward, but they do it for benevolence and justice of the universe. Uh, so as I said before, Akron being a galaxy ranger, there has to be evil afoot on Pinaconi for her to be there. And we might know what her past is, maybe when we enter Pinaconi or possibly a future patch. She is going to be released, like at the time of this recording, version 2.1 of Honkai Star Rail will come out in roughly three weeks, as well as the release of Acheron, Acheron of whom I'm going to be pulling for and wanting to know more about Galaxy Rangers on why she's a Galaxy Ranger and see who she's trying to hunt down just to uphold justice, you know? Like what kind of justice does she have to enact? Also the mention of Lord Ravager Zulo officially assassinated, Lord Ravagers being emanators of destruction. And there's also other Lord Ravager names that we learned from back in the Gienzo when we were fighting against Fantilia. Yeah, I just looked in my notes. There's Zephyro and Selenova, also Lord Ravagers. Related entries? Lawn the Hunt. Doctors of Chaos, Nahelity. We do not heal the body nor free the soul. We do not covet life nor shun death. We honor existence itself from Morong, the Doctor of Chaos. Well, there's a couple of freaking factions affiliated with Ix the Nihility, but when we go into Ix the Nihility, there's no related factions down here. What the heck is going on? The Aeon is just as mysterious and devastating as these factions. I'm not gonna lie. Existence is nothing. When an organism has this thought and applies it as a guiding principle, it begins to walk on the path ruled by Ix and receive the meaningless glimpse of the Aeon from some distant void. This will usually have two outcomes. One, the organism will devolve and truly become nothing, becoming something called a self-annihilator. And two, the organism will be captivated by the magnificence of the Aeon, thus becoming a doctor of chaos in their spontaneous curiosity. So once someone or something has this principle, existence is nothing, they'll either be nothing, becoming a self Annihilator? Like what? What well, some kind of detrimental, self-deprecating thing of existence? And or two, be a doctor of chaos. Out of curiosity. We can't let Ix into our minds. That would be pretty dangerous. Doctors of Chaos uphold a creed of saving the world. If they are able to prove to Ix that existence is more than nothing, they could free that large and lonely soul from the depths of the void. What they try to prove is a paradox, and it cannot be done by mortals. Yet the Doctors of Chaos seem to enjoy trying, because the moment they perceive the worthlessness of life, that glance from the distant cosmos inspired within them a futile desire to revolt against meaningless destiny. Doctors of Chaos uphold a creed of saving the world? So if they can prove to Ix that existence is not meaningless, then they can save themselves of the darkness of within their own soul and find meaning, happiness, and joy, and figure out that they have light within them. What they try to prove is a paradox and can't be done by mortals. Why? How? But the Doctors of Chaos enjoy trying? So these Doctors of Chaos, the moment they understand how life is worthless, then they understand how valuable light and life is. You know, you have to, what is that quote? You have to be in the dark to understand where the light is? Is that what these Doctors of Chaos have to prove? Like have to understand? As understanding both sides of the spectrum, light and day, not only within your own life, but also in principle. Related entries, IX. Now, Device IX, Nihility. Device IX is real. Go find it. There lies all of Dr. Primitive's secrets. Some drunken galaxy ranger. Oh, goodness. Everything in the universe is bound by the prison of existence, constrained by their body and mind, and blinded by the world's superficial appearance. Even the most intelligent beings cannot comprehend this. Matter, order, logic, and life. Everything that makes up reality is but one side of the coin. On the opposite of equal entropy, there exists nihility. The two balance each other to create the complete universe. Okay, this first paragraph. Again, very pessimistic about the existence of life, but this perspective. Reality and existence are one side of the coin, and then meaningless and nihility is on the other. And they're saying it creates the complete universe between existence and non-existence. Legend has it that a mysterious faction known as Device IX lurks in the empty reflections of void, difficult to be perceived by the material world. Those who gaze into the void for a long time will gradually be drawn to the dark energy overflowing in the abyss, Genshin, eventually passing through the dark web that separates reality from nothingness. This legend has yet to be proven though. 
Hmm, this is only a legend, so we don't know if it's fact or not. The only thing that I can think of is something like New State Air Edition, but surrounded by deliberate darkness. If you stare into the darkness, the darkness stares back and you'll gradually be drawn in, into the abyss, and slowly devolving into nothingness. You guys know that depiction of IX, like why IX has freaking eyes? That's exactly what I'm thinking of. Device IX is a mysterious faction though. Very suspicious. There's even a dark web? mention here. Whatever you guys do, do not search up dark web like IRL. Don't do it. Don't do it. Not worth it. Not that I have any experience in doing so, but I also heard that it contains a lot of disturbing content. So, but dark web here in Honkai Star Rail? Like what the heck is that? The most prestigious geniuses in the universe attempted to solve this mystery, challenging device IX with no results. Why was this organization created? What are its goals? How many members does it have and what do they do? Does device IX truly exist? The answer is as empty as the question itself. Yeah, as I said before even reading this, the Aeon is just just as mysterious as these factions. Like these Doctors of Chaos are practically insane. And Device IX, we don't really know if it actually exists or not. This whole thing could be fake. And if they do exist, they likely have embraced the darkness inside of them. <laughs> Maybe they want to make us go insane too. And only related entry, IX. Denizens of Abundance. Abundance. One flower blooms while thousands more wrinkle. Bones tell no tales to abundance most fickle. I don't know if I should call those bars while spitting some very deathly and gloomy words. From World's History as a Mirror, the denizens of abundance create poetry and art in the name of their beloved god, spreading the love and kindness of Yaoshi throughout the universe. Spreading love and kindness. In the worlds blessed by Yaoshi, the water never runs dry and creatures are free from the cruel binds of time. Life is free to bloom as it sees fit. In the worlds blessed by Yaoshi, age is but a number, and mortals are not afraid of aging and death. They enjoy their lives to the fullest. Yeah, keep capping. Keep capping. Like me, after playing Bai Lu's companion mission, as well as Yu Kong's, and going through the whole Jianzo arc, this is nothing but cap. This whole first freaking paragraph. And also one who watched the Myriad Celestia trailer between Lon the Hunt and Yaoshi the Abundance. Like, this is probably one of the fakest Aeons I've ever seen. Though its denizens come from different worlds, they all tell the same story. Thousands of years ago, war ravaged their lands. Their short lives of mortals bred greed and fear, which gave rise to plunder and tyranny. As demons and plagues ran rampant, the very fate of this world and its denizens were at stake in the flames of war, until a kind god descended and planted a flower seed as warm as the sunshine. The moment the seed touched the earth, the whole world was transformed. Parched soil began to heal and muddy waters became clear. Mortals tortured by wounds and disease were no longer in pain. People's hearts were no longer filled by sorrow. Humankind discarded their blood-stained weapons and began spontaneously praising the blessings from the God of Abundance. Yaoshi ended the suffering of these worlds and bestowed upon mortal bodies and souls that could withstand the corrosion of time. In return, the denizens of Abundance made Yaoshi's name known to the universe to show their gratitude. Rumors started to spread that certain hunters who roam between worlds regard Yaoshi as evil and their creations as abominations. The loyal denizens of abundance will not tolerate such blatant blasphemy. The accusers who slander God will pay. So I guess these denizens resolve is just as strong as Yaoshi's. We saw that from the Gianzo arc where these denizens of abundance regard anyone from the Gianzo as well as like anyone who slanders the name of Yaoshi as heathens, as monsters, as insignificant, basically losers. Like we hate you for disrespecting our god. May death be the least of your worries, you know? So I guess the denizens of abundance and the Gianzo alliance are just gonna be at war for however long, sadly. Do you guys know what I'm saying? Why do these people have a positive and joyful experience from Yaoshi abundance compared to the people of the Gianzo? I, I don't understand. Related entries? Yaoshi the abundance. Ah, <sighs> well, next up. Elixir Seekers. Abundance. A wanderer cloaked in stars, why are you so obstinate? You seek only a poison that will annihilate the joys that mortality gave to life. Fables about the stars. Conflict and turmoil linger everywhere in an already short lifespan. 
The lust and ambitions of the living continuously spark conflict and disaster. Transience of life has driven many ordinary people into madness. In order to escape the pain and burden that mortality has brought upon civilization, worlds upon worlds have sent out faithful emissaries of abundance in hopes of finding the famous Yashi and acquiring the elixir of immortality. Worlds upon worlds have sent out faithful emissaries of abundance in hopes of finding the famous Yashi and acquiring the elixir of immortality. These elixir seekers all come from different backgrounds. Some are royals with the command of an entire fleet, while some are just lonely travelers who have nothing but themselves. What they do have in common, however, is the obsession over immortality. The Gienzo Alliance has repeatedly warned blind followers that there is a cost that lies behind the blessings of abundance. Very true. However, their warnings have always fallen on deaf ears. Arrogance and fear have always trumped the voice of reason, pushing elixir seekers further on their fruitless voyage. Among the vast number of elixir seekers, how many have seen the face of the abundance? How many can succeed in returning to their civilization with the supposed medicine of salvation. Sadly, these immortality-seeking voyagers have chosen to ignore the harrowing wails of the long-lived monsters that have terrorized the universe. Yeah, same with these denizens of abundance. It is this constant obsession of immortality because they hate seeing people die. They hate having weaknesses. They hate having faults. They hate having, uh, like said in the Denizens of Abundance um, section, dirty water, not enough resources, people and everything around them being temporary, when all they want is just peace and relaxation. And what the elixir seekers hope to get from Yaoshi the Abundance is immortality in all these things. And as said here, the Jianzo Alliance has repeatedly warned blind followers there's a cost of being blessed by Yaoshi the Abundance. But sadly, these elixir seekers have found nothing. Yaoshi's like, yo, hey, like here, here are these immortal blessings that it seems like you need. Wanting the immortal elixir from Yaoshi. Yaoshi literally never provides. This is what I'm saying guys. Yashi is one of the fakest Aeons I've ever seen in my whole entire life playing this game. <laughs> elixir seekers, they're just wasting their time trying to get the elixir they seek and following Yashi in general. Their efforts will be for nothing. I'd like to think Yashi is one of the most evil Aeons so far. I mean compared to Ix and Ouroboros, Yashi is evil but Ouroboros just wants to destroy everything, consume every single planet and star. Ix just doesn't care about the existence distance. Nanook just wants to destroy everything. Dang, dude. These Aeons are crazy, but I'd like to think the factions are even crazier. Related entries? Yeah, she. Antimatter Legion. Destruction. The Emissary in Black asked, For what purpose do you live? He could only give a vague and obscure response, even after thinking about it for a while. The deadly smile appears across the Emissary's face. Let me put it another way. Why are you still alive? From Fables About the Stars. Uh, I don't know how to feel about that. I'm kind of scared of this Emissary in black now. Nanook, the Aeon of Destruction, commands a vast legion that brings chaos and destruction to the worlds. Loyal followers of Nanook swear to embark on the path of destruction, placing themselves at the absolute opposite of life and civilization. They are known as the Antimatter Legion that spreads terror throughout the universe. These are a chaotic lot, and every time I fight them, they get freaking destroyed. As easy as facing off against them in battle is, they are quite plenty plentiful, and in all reality quite dangerous. The fiercest races of the universe act as vanguards for the Legion. They are also evil strategists who plot out the destruction of worlds and act as the brains of the Legion. Innocent new worlds are ruthlessly destroyed, while proud and mature civilizations are first to learn humility while on the brink of collapse. The will of destruction will only slow down when faced with a dying world. The Legion saunters over planets on the verge of being shattered, devouring the chaotic energy emitted by the process of decay. Only when the last flame of civilization has been extinguished will they leave contently to search for their next target. Worlds swept by the tide of the Legion ask helplessly in their dying moments, why? Amidst the victims' cries of despair, the countless evils in the Legion sneer so heinously that even the stars shudder. It is said that as demons and evils roam, sometimes the shadow of Nanook would emerge from the starry sky to witness a tragic end of another world. Nanook and the Antimatter Legion actually ruthless. The fiercest races of the universe act as vanguards for the Legion. Beings like Fantilia and the other Lord Ravagers, innocent new worlds, 
and these proud and mature civilizations destroyed. So Nanook and the Antimatter Legion are like, yo, here's a here's a wonderful, fresh new planet for you guys to destroy. And even sometimes the shadow of Nanook would come to witness the tragic end of all these worlds. The Antimatter Legion is full of monsters with no no empathy, no apathy, no emotion. Literally on the hunt to kill, to destroy countless worlds and then leave it at that. After they're done, they're like, yo, what's the next planet? What's the next civilization we're gonna destroy, huh? Actually, heartless beings. I mean, they don't really have a brain, do they? No feelings, no emotions, just a plan to destroy any and every world that they decide to embark on. So sad. So sad. Annihilation Gang. Destruction. The value Nanook sees in the Annihilation Gang may be less than the value an infant sees when they smash a vase. Research into Destruction by Dr. Primitive. I think it was Dr. Ratio who quoted this book by Dr. Primitive after we saw Duke Inferno. Not all fanatical devotees of the Path of Destruction are welcomed into the Antimatter Legion. There are many murderous species throughout the cosmos obsessed with pillaging and annihilation, but they lack the ability to systematically pursue the will of destruction. The scumbags of the Annihilation Gang fantasize about one day serving as pioneers of destruction, but they have no idea that their cruelty only incurs Nanook's utter contempt for them. The more the Annihilation Gang loves and follows Nanook the destruction, the more Nanook sees them as worthless, negligent, and basically doesn't care about any of these people. The reason is that the Annihilation Gang's goal behind their thirst for destruction is not pure enough. Chaotic desires are also mixed therein, with some taking pleasure in bloody slaughter, some plundering as an excuse for filthy vengeance, and some relying on endless destruction to calm their internal madness. They claim to be loyal followers of destruction, but never escape the enslavement of their own selfish desires. These marauders roam the stars, dragging everything they touch into a vortex of havoc. They will not abandon their feeble personal ideals, and so must endure the tortures of eternal spiritual exile. Yeah, the Annihilation Gang, the Everflame Mansion, it's the mixture of not only some principles or like a majority of the will of Nanook the Destruction, but also along with their own personal reason for the chaotic desires here. So to be a complete follower of Nanook the Destruction, they have to let go of their own personal desires and just align their will with Nanooks completely. But either way, the Antimatter Legion, the Annihilation Gang, completely ruthless, no feeling, no emotion, just a love for non-stop, never-ending destruction everywhere you go. Related entries, Nanook the Destruction. The family, harmony. The world is in harmony and the stars shine bright. Praise the Lord's boundless virtue. All humans are brethren and all things are connected. The winds of blessing sweep across the lands from Odes of Harmony, Seven. In the vision of the harmony, the diverse civilizations throughout the universe will eventually become as close as siblings, singing in unison the hymn of unity and joy. The universe will become a harmonious whole with no discordant notes to disrupt the beautiful chords and no fools worrying about their own short-sighted futures. Thus, under the loving radiance of the Aeon Shipe, their chosen people formed a harmonious family. They come from different worlds, belong to different civilizations, and have different identities, but they are at the same time the closest family members there are. There is never noisy disputes or even contradictions among its members. Only eternal love and smiles. There is no more harmonious family in the universe than them. The family calls out to other worlds with their song, encouraging them to embrace harmony. Whenever new worlds accept the blessing of Shipei, the family will celebrate, rejoice, and work even harder at praising the Aeon's kindness. But not every blessed world can become a member of the family. Few would mention the civilizations that perish out of stupidity or hubris. People are also curious whether any members of the family had grown tired of the one and voluntarily abandoned the path of harmony. In the face of such a question, the family smiles and replies, never. So it really seems like the family is a very peaceful faction. And whether someone abandons the path, the family doesn't think less of them. The family consists of very different people from different worlds, different identities, different cultures, but they all have the same principles, the same goal of just becoming one in people and one in mind. So it really seems like the family and Shipei are the kindest people that we see in this faction section. Related entries, Shipei the Harmony. Genius Society, Erudition. Into the hollowed halls step pride, ardor, and reason traversing the length of a corridor etched with the inscription of knowledge and truth, transmuting into the embodiment of loneliness, apathy, and frenzy. From Fables About the Stars. New stays in a corner of the cosmos, working out the equations of the universe made up of trillions of variables 
symbols and deriving the unknown laws of imaginary numbers. Once in a while, a spark of intelligence flashes in a mortal world. The Aeon of Erudition sends a signal to its source, inviting geniuses to join in the search for answers to the universe. Many people misinterpret the signal, thinking the invitation to the Genius Society merely represents the favor and approval of the Aeon. Then, they proudly continue to devote themselves to their studies, and aware that the solution to the problems that they have spent their whole life searching for had already been solved by news thousands of years ago. Wow. News just wasn't two steps ahead, they were thousands of years ahead. Dang. Literally, galaxy brain. The galaxy brain of the universe. There are also those who rejoice, thinking they have already reached greatness and had created priceless assets of civilization with their diligence and wisdom. They were sure that their life's achievements deserved Noose's approval. These geniuses were eager for a response from Noose, but the erudition has no time to appreciate the insignificant achievements of mere mortals. Their silence was deafening. Certain geniuses are proud of what they finally figured out after so long, and the Noose is like, I don't have time for that. I already figured that out thousands of years ago. Your achievements are insignificant compared to mine, okay? Know your place. Yes, news being a very logical Aeon instead of an empathetic Aeon compared to Akivili. No feelings, just facts. Only very few can ascertain news's intentions. They humbly ask questions and seek guidance from the erudition. These enlightened few then disappear from the world, only leaving behind their world-shattering answers. The answer to the universe is beyond the limits of mortal wisdom. Only geniuses who can clearly acknowledge this conclusion can break free from the shackles of worldly curiosity, becoming true members of the genius society. So it's people like Herta, Skrulum, Steven, and Juan May that want to break the limits of mortal wisdom. Everyone having at least a thousand plus IQ compared to me the trailblazer who has like at least five at best. What I'm wondering is when Skrulum and Steven are going to be playable. Like their genius society members too, why can't they be playable? Related entries, Noose the Erudition, Herta the character, and Aiden the character. I wonder if this Aiden character is going to be playable in the future. Yeah, he is mentioned in terms, gotcha. Okay. Intelligentsia Guild, Erudition. The universe is vast and knowledge is universal. Both the genius and the mediocre have their own way of living. How I joined the genius society and became enlightened by Herta. Dang. Herta's writing her own books, her own stories. I also wonder what Herta's past is like. I know she's a puppet on her own space station, but I wonder how long she's been alive and why she has multiple puppet bodies. Only the cream of the crop can become members of the Genius Society, but the Intelligentsia Guild wastes not. The Guild is willing to accept all beings from the infinite universe who seek to learn as well as providing all that is needed for the full pursuit of knowledge. The Intelligentsia Guild advocates that all knowledge must be circulated like currency. Therefore, although there are different schools that specialize in different subjects within the Guild, Everyone is actively engaged with one another with no isolationism. Members trade knowledge for wisdom and formulas for recipes, seeking to achieve mastery. Each school, like a business, pays for itself, and academic circulation has achieved the maximum efficiency proposed in economic models. An elder in the Genius Society thought the Intelligentsia Guild as laughingstock. However, as an open academic organization, the Intelligentsia Guild was above such mockery. After a long period of research and exploration, its members have reached a consensus that the only way to transcend the limitations of the individual is to have an academic network of mutual learning. So basically, the Genius Society and the Intelligentsia Guild don't care much for who makes fun of them as long as there's valuable life principles and lessons to learn from every experience, especially in an academic setting. So the people who follow Nusi Erudition always have that pursuit of wanting to learn more. They acknowledge that they don't know everything. They're always on the constant pursuit of asking questions, learning from experience, learning from others, trial and error. Error. That's something I highly respect out of the Intelligentsia Guild and the Genius Society, but honestly, I don't know which faction I would be a part of <laughs> so far. Everyone seems pretty insane. The only sane one, honestly, is like the Astro Express and the Nameless, and maybe the family. But I cannot be in the constant pursuit of unanswered questions and knowledge all the time. That must take a lot of work. Related entries, News the Erudition, and the IPC. The Architects. Preservation. The foolish have their wall of flesh, and the greedy have their wall of riches. When the end comes, they will all turn to ash. My life is too short. By Anonymous. Legend has it, the Aeon of Preservation, Klipoth, is the oldest Aeon. Silent and mighty, Klipoth built a light years long barrier around the cosmos, never engaging in any trivial conflicts of badgering with the other Aeons. 
So Klopoth is a very passive, yet very stern Aeon. Civilizations across the cosmos speculate on the motive of Klopoth. One said the ancient Aeon foresaw a disaster that could obliterate the cosmos, so Klopoth built a barrier to protect the worlds. One said Klopoth was willing to slave for other Aeons, and was ordered to build walls for them. There is no way to verify the truth, but Klopoth's tireless actions moved the mortals. They spontaneously gathered in groups to build a barrier to protect their planet. Some architects have claimed to feel the protective gaze of the Aeon upon them. They liken it to a gaze of approval, tinged with the warmth of the forge and the smell of lime. Very particular. Klopoth being the actual goat and protecting these living worlds against a foreseen disaster that could obliterate the whole universe. And in regards to Klopoth building all of these barriers, protections, and walls for all of these worlds, people saw what Klopoth was doing and they decided to build walls themselves to protect their own planet instead of Klopoth making a bigger wall for them. It's like, hey, oh my gosh, Klopoth, thank you for building this wall of protection for us. We're gonna start following you now, so it's Instead of you making that wall for us, we're gonna make our own walls to protect ourselves too. And in response, Klopoth approved of these protections for them. The annihilation of a single star can devastate planets thousands of light years away, pushing them to the precipice of extinction. On the rare occasions of such calamities, worlds are saved only by the walls their denizens have built. People who survived their demise no longer mock the stubbornness of the architects. Instead, they join them, never to question their motives or the meaning of preservation ever again. The annihilation of a single star, huh? Then Klopoth is actually needed throughout the universe, an aeon to protect all of the living worlds from devastation, from an abrupt destruction of a star, or even from other aeons. Related entries, Klopoth the Preservation. Now, the IPC. With all due respect, is there anyone in the universe more enlightened than our chair, Klopoth? Klopoth acquiesces in all our business decisions, never asking or questioning why. How great a privilege, how great a trust. From Oswaldo Schneider, head of International Peace Corporation Marketing Development Department, level P47. To outsiders, the IPC is an enormous consortium advocating free trade. From a business perspective, the IPC is a business that issues money and monopolizes resources. From a startup perspective, the IPC is a selfless support group dedicated to the Aeon of Preservation. When many astral citizens talk about the IPC, they talk about its ubiquitous merchandise and logo. It's as if the IPC exists whenever there is a transaction. In fact, almost all business transactions in the cosmos are based on the credit system created by the IPC. If one were to compare international trade to a sports competition, the IPC would be the top athletes as well as the sports, the venue, and the roles themselves. They are their own business. Its absolute dominance over wealth and relentless expansion has given the IPC the image of a conspiratorial business dictatorship, but the IPC pays little attention to lowly ambitions such as dictatorship because its spirit hasn't wavered since its creation. Give everything to the Amber Lord, Klepoth. Yeah, the IPC being the business transactors within every single living world in the universe, they are basically everywhere. The IPC created the credit system, they provide resources to other planets, and between planets, they'd be everywhere and everything you see. And the IPC's slogan, give everything to the Amber Lord Klopoth, I'd like to compare it to how Klopoth provides protection to all the living worlds on a universal planetary scale versus the IPC who provides protection and resources on a business transactional scale. Related entries, Klopoth the Preservation, and Louis Fleming, the character. Another character we're going to learn about in the term section. And it seems that is all for the main Aeons and the factions who follow them. Now we're going to move on to the other Aeons and factions. The Swarm, Propagation. Human desires are complex, twisted, and even ugly. By contrast, the aesthetics of the Swarm and Legion are so pure, it's admirable. Some scientist before he went mad. Yeah, don't trust scientists before they go mad. I mean, I don't know if it was foreseen that he was gonna go mad, but I believe that there were like some symptoms or signs that they were likely going to go crazy. And for this scientist to compare how disgusting and weird humans are to how calling the swarm and legion pure and human desires complex, twisted, and ugly, do you really think you're gonna believe them? Life is born of an instinctive desire to reproduce, and the senses and spirit are only unintended byproducts created when carrying out the basic instinct of reproduction. Those who don't submit to their primal desire claim to be wise, unaware that they are already considered food for the offspring of Tezeron, the Aeon of Propagation. 
the father of the swarm. The multitudes of the swarm king's offspring can cover the starry night, their antenna long enough to measure the cosmos. Worlds fearfully call the self-replicated chaos as the swarm. Spirit, soul, technology, philosophy. In the thousand compound eyes of Tazeranth, the universal laws pursued by all intelligent races are but a side effect of the ultimate goal of reproduction. The swarm doesn't seek a following by higher races, for worship itself is an unnecessary desire. Only the flying creatures that succumb to the primal instinct will be attracted to the self-replicating primordial tide, transforming to be part of the swarm after becoming its food. Even without their god, the swarm continues expanding at an incalculable rate, bringing fear and disaster to worlds chosen as their nests. Tazeranth and the Swarm, very antagonistic characteristics about them. For example, those who don't submit to their primal desire claim to be wise, unaware that they are already considered food for Tazeranth and the Swarm. Tazeranth just wants to duplicate over and over again until they fill the universe and ultimately eat all of the worlds, eat all of the living and dead beings, no matter where they go. I'd say Tazeranth and the Swarm is probably one of the scariest factions and aeons like in this game. And in this last statement here, even though Tazeranth is gone, the Swarm still exists. Like there still exists these gigantic beetle bugs like as we've seen from the seclusion zone with Ruan Mei, as well as the simulated universe. Like there still must be planets that still have Tezron's influence and also swarm disaster monsters that are still on them. I hope we don't encounter them in the future. Related entries, Tezron the Propagation. Garden of Recollection, Remembrance. For those who spend their lives in the desert, even the fleeting memory of aquatic life is priceless. Fables about the stars. To think is to exist, and memories are proofs of that. All things that make up the material world will eventually perish, but they can live on in another way, through remembrance. Contrary to popular belief that memory is fixed with the imaginary, memo keepers from the Garden of Recollection believe reality and imagination to be a myth. What is absolutely real and immortal in the universe that is constantly reincarnating? Even stars die and black holes evaporate. On a cosmic scale, they vanish in a breath. In this flood of time and life, the only treasure is the memory that proves the existence of people. Memo keepers from the Garden of Recollection are dedicated to preserving and sharing memories. Enlightened by their master fully, Memo Keepers shed their mortal flesh and live on as mimetic entities. With this unique gift, they can freely traverse between worlds, unconstrained by physical limits. Memo Keepers often disguise themselves as natives of the worlds they visit. They trade, copy, steal, deceive, using every means necessary to collect precious memories. Yeah, I heard there were two types of deaths. The one where you die in real life and then when you die in someone's memory, like if you don't think about someone ever again, then that is their second death. No one remembers who they are. And for someone's life to be preserved, they live in the memories of people. And memo keepers are dedicated to preserving these memories by constantly remembering these people. And they gave up their physical drives, their limits. And they also disguise themselves on worlds. I don't know how, like I think like any NPC that we see, on every world could be a memo keeper taking notes of all of the memories that happen in people's lives and like collect them and preserve them for fully the remembrance that by the time the universe collapses in on itself fully is there to make the universe again based off of the memories that have been preserved or at least that's what i think related entries fully the remembrance the cremators remembrance worthless memories dissolve in time like tears in rain from the memories of memo keeper Roy Roy Hampton before execution, 2053 AE. Memo Keeper Roy Hampton before execution? So if Memo Keepers reveal their identity, they gave up their physical limits, right? Like their body, their emotions, but it didn't say their name. So I believe that if Memo Keepers reveal their actual name, then they die or they are like terminated on the spot by fully the remembrance. Is that what that person said right next to the Forgotten Hall? That if they reveal certain types of information, then they are executed on the spot. That makes me think if Black Swan is her actual name. Obviously not, it doesn't really sound like 
an actual name. It's more of like a title or a code name. It makes me think if Black Swan reveals her real name, then she dies. And I don't want that to happen. In the Garden of Recollection, where memories of the universe are sought and kept, hides a group of extreme memo keepers who view the marks of existence differently. Instead of treasuring all that has taken place like their colleagues, they believe that there are different qualities and priorities of memories in the world, and that the pure land created by Fully should not be taken up by the worthless memories. Interesting. The cremators believe that they bear the duty of filtering memories for the Aeon. They steal the stored memories that memo keepers have gathered and rank them in order of importance. The ones that they deem worthy are returned to the collection, whereas the ones arbitrarily deemed unworthy are completely destroyed, never to be found again. Very ruthless of them. So the cremators are the judges of how important these memories are. If they deem it as important, it goes back into the storage file of all of the memories for fully. But if they deem it as not important and worthless, it's completely destroyed, completely forgotten, not worth remembering. How sad. The cremators claim that they are cleaning out the garbage in hopes of relieving some of Fully's burdens and contributing to the Aeon's glorious work of making a pure land of memories. However, the Garden of Recollection scoffed and saw no reason for their actions. For even the smallest shard of memory in the universe holds has a reason to exist. No mortal has the right to judge the value of memory. So true! Real question, are the cremators the same as the memo snatchers that that person right by the forgotten hall mentioned. There's memo keepers and memo snatchers. I don't know if the cremators are the same as the memo snatchers. Like they steal memories, but I don't know if they're like the judges of those same memories. The Garden of Recollection is like, yeah, we don't really need you to do that because all of these memories are precious. And the cremators are like, yo, no, these memories are worthless. We, why would, why would fully want that? And the Garden of Recollection responds with, well, you're not the judge of uh, what fully should and shouldn't keep. So I don't know if we're going to see or meet any cremators in the future. And they are not the deciders of what fully keeps in their memory storage files. Related entries, fully. Morning actors, elation. They do not laugh, only cry. The more they cried, the harder I laughed. I laughed and laughed until tears fell down my face. And you know what morning actors did? They handed me a tissue. <laughs> a mask full with no name. That's actually pretty funny. Morning actors are firm believers against elation. They believe life is full of ups and downs, that agony makes people mature, but fleeting joy only offers hopeless and unreachable temptation. Interesting. Cheap entertainment is a narcotic for humans to lose themselves in. All beings should renounce joy and endure grief to temper their spirits. To this end, these people formed a theater troupe of sorrow. The actors ride a gondola that spans the stars to perform. They collect and wear masks from different worlds, symbolizing the races that have passed and those that have not. At the same time, they record the sorrows of intelligent life. They compose magnificent tragedies for heroes facing their end and sing graceful elegies for dying stars. Morning actors advocate celibacy and penance, hoping this would go against the path of elation and dilute the sweet allure that the elation has been able to provide to the universe. However, joy and sadness are two sides of the same coin. Their very essence is engraved into the souls of all beings. The Aeon of Elation sees the potential strength in the beauty of tragedy. Perhaps out of fondness for their wicked sense of humor, Aha bless these people with Aeonic powers playfully helping them spread their renunciation of joy across many star systems. Compared to the masked fools, I think these morning actors are the ones to enact or uphold sadness and sorrow wherever they please. I think this is another pessimistic type of faction. So Aha bless these people with Aeonic powers to enhance and influence the emotion of sadness. Because as said here, the elation sees the potential strength in the beauty of tragedy. So it's understanding both sides of the coin, essentially. Not only joy, which Aha uh -huh is very fond and supportive of, but also tragedy and mourning. Aha uh -huh also helping them spread their enunciation of joy. So I'd like to think that Aha uh -huh has two sides to them. The side where they're very supportive of having a laugh at the end of the day and feeling joy, but also here I'm learning that Aha uh -huh is very supportive of finding power in tragedy and sorrow. But these morning actors are believers against Aha. So why has Aha blessed them with Aeonic powers? Seems pretty weird to me. Perhaps out of the fondness of their wicked sense of humor. Perhaps, maybe, we don't know. I don't know if I'd like to interact with some of these morning actors 
I would prefer if I would avoid them. Related entries, aha the elation. Masked Fools, elation. Even an organization like the Masked Fools sing praises of their Aeon. The Aeon will never give you up, never let you down, or run around and desert you. They'll never make you cry, say goodbye, or tell a lie and hurt you by Asked Rickley. Super pop star of the Epsilon 12 system. Gosh. I got Rickrolled twice. I hate all of you. I just got Rickrolled, man. You Hoyoverse writers are a bunch of trolls, you hear me? You get me to pay every half patch whenever I try to farm for relics. You always give me HP, defense, base defense, and base attack. Alright, this is the last straw Hoyoverse. I'm not having any of it. I think some of these Hoyoverse writers deserve a raise though. That was a really good joke. The masked fools tell a parable of the birth of their beloved Aeon. When the Aeon of Elation climbed to the highest branch of the Tree of Existence, another Tree of Existence mentioned, they saw the cold and despicable void, the stars operating like machinery, and how the meaning of all things bows before nothingness. They continued looking until they saw a baby fall to the ground and cry because it had been wronged. The Aeon burst into laughter, laughter so clear it tore through the cold universe and still reverberates through the universe today. Dang, how can you drop a baby like that and Aha's laughing like there's no tomorrow. Now I'm thinking that Aha's not necessarily evil but highly rude to mortals in this universe. The fools believe that the truth of the world is a joke and that the ultimate meaning of all things lies in mere laughter. The universe is merciless but there is joy to eliminate pain. Dilute sorrow, resist nihilism, and heal wounds. Laughter, the gift of intelligent races, is the only answer. Masked fools are extremely radical when it comes to their beliefs among the followers of Elation and the pursuit of pleasure they do whatever it takes to find it, often causing havoc wherever they go. They laugh at heroes for self-righteousness, kings for their lust of power, lovers for their infatuation, and scholars for their overthinking. The fool's objective is to stir the stagnant pool of life to create surges and change because change is a source of mockery and amusement to the fools. It would be a welcome sight if someone could turn the tables on them. Hmm, perhaps in the future, perhaps. And again, these masked fools are very passive, not really one to get into conflict or have the drive of solving problems in the world, but more of laughter, the gift of intelligent races. Another thing too, the Aeon of Elation climbed to the highest branch on the Tree of Existence. Huh? I'm really interested to see what Tree of Existence they're talking about. Related entries, aha, the Elation. Mirror Holders, the beauty. The mirror holder gazes into the mirror, but recognizes not the face staring back from fables about the stars. The legend of the mirror holders had it that the downfall of the God of Beauty was an ancient metaphor symbolizing the shattering of people's views on beauty crumbling like a collapsed tower into rubble and bricks. Therefore, the goal of the mirror holders takes on another significance. When conceptions of beauty are reunified, all disputes and strife will disappear. They believe the Aeon they worship will be perfect and complete again, and the universe will become whole. This may not be a mere delusion, as the mirror holders possess a series of items named mirrors of transcendence. These mirrors do not reflect the material world, but instead reflect what is considered by the beholder as beauty, and project that into reality. That makes me think of her Tuz light cone, I forgot what it was called, but she's holding a mirror and there's like reflections of herself in the mirror as well. So I'm wondering if that's the same type of mirror, like the mirror of transcendence as mentioned here, and if Herta is very prideful and infatuated with her own self and her own intelligence that she only considers herself as beautiful and projects that into reality. As the mirror holders recounted themselves, these mirrors were fragments of Adrilla's divine form. When the god of beauty died, their fragments fragments were scattered to the cosmos. The wandering mirror holders tried their best to find clues and recapture these fragments, hoping to one day piece everything back together and let beauty return to the world. So these mirror holders are on a quest to find these lost mirror fragments and I think it's a prophecy or a legend that if they piece every single fragment together, Adrilla the Beauty will be reincarnated or resurrected into the universe. The Knights of Beauty. If I win, please admit that Adrilla the Beauty is the most beautiful of all. Argenti, Knight of Beauty. Wow, thanks Argenti. 
Really appreciate it. Among the legions of Adrilla's followers, the most infatuated with classical beauty form the Knights of Beauty. They ride their faithful and dexterous mounts and chant ancient beautiful songs as they fearlessly travel from planet to planet, extolling the name of Adrilla to the beings of the universe. The Knights of Beauty are extremely self-disciplined. They stubbornly abide by an obsolete creed known as the Code of Chivalry, believing that only through a perfectly refined body, mind, and spirit can they become truly worthy of worshipping Adrilla. Despite their extraordinary strength, the major factions of the cosmos most hold the knights of beauty in low regard. Warriors with only worship but little faith are but wastrels traversing the universe and cannot form a powerful force. Rumor has it that the knights of beauty do not believe in the fall of Adrilla. They shuttle back and forth across the universe. Their source of power still a mystery. Yeah, I still haven't played Argenti's companion mission, but back in the version 1.5 trailer, I believe, Argenti just showed up out of nowhere, and based off of his own character trailer, Dan Hung knew about the Knights of Beauty, and he was like, oh, it's just another Knight, uh, Knight of Beauty. Because as said here, the major factions of the cosmos hold the Knights of Beauty in low regard. The Knights of Beauty are one of the most disrespected and overlooked factions or people in the universe. They're simply just traveling, trying to tell everybody about Idrilla the beauty. They're beautiful, aren't they? And everyone's just confused, like, what the heck are you talking about? That person's just crazy because they're a knight of beauty, you know? But as said here, their source of power is still a mystery, so we don't know if Idrilla's influence is still lingering in the universe. Dang, I kind of feel bad for these knights of beauty. I'd like to imagine how powerful Argenti or any of the knights of beauty could be if Idrilla was still alive. History fictionologists. Enigmata. History is not mired in truth. Reality can be distorted. We should let the past cease to stay in the past. It only exists in the here and now, in our brains where everyone can embellish it. The Five Millennia Void by history fictionologist Lou Dalkin. There is evidence that history fictionologists are a group of emanators that were enlightened by aeons. They often plunge into the sea of stars alone, traveling planet to planet with the sole purpose of fabricating, obscuring, destroying, and erasing the local history. History fictionologists believe that the past determines the future. When a civilization's history is definite, its future development is doomed as all possibilities are eliminated, leaving only a sad and rigid path forward. In order to save these worlds from the sad fate of objectivity, history fictionologists considered enigmata as their only creed and are determined to shroud the universe in mystery. History fictionologists carry out their mission of destroying history alone and decisively with an altruism that is difficult to comprehend. Their views are poorly understood by most, and their blatant hatred of objective facts is somewhat extreme. Many worlds are beginning to realize the irreversible, intangible damage that these emanators of enigmata have caused to culture. Across the cosmos, history fictionologists have a reputation comparable to that of the Antimatter Legion. The Intelligentsia Guild has publicly denounced them. The Antimatter Legion destroys matter, but the history fictionologists destroy the universe itself. Record stamp. In view of the fact that this entry has been edited with unknown attribution, it is hereby declared that this entry is inapplicable to any reference and will no longer be updated. That's weird. I'd like to thank these history fictionologists or the, or the Aeon of Enigmata. Mythos is the complete and exact opposite of Fully the Remembrance, where Fully wants to preserve the memories of the universe and the people here. But history fictionologists just wants to fabricate, obscure, destroy everything about history. And when being compared to the Antimatter Legion or Nanook, the Antimatter Legion destroys matter, but the history fictionologists destroy the universe itself. Like, I think these history fictionologists are also a really overlooked but somewhat underwhelming faction. I'd say their danger level is relatively high, especially when this record stamp is here, when this whole entry is inapplicable to any reference and will no longer be updated. It's like, these history fictionologists are making history, like they're doing things in the universe, but they refuse to update what they're actually doing in the cosmos. It's like they want to hide their crimes or their sins from the IPC network, you know, because the IPC lets every single planet know of what's going on in the universe. Like, for example, the wanted Stellaron Hunters, disappearance of Herta after what Duke Inferno did. So it really does seem like they're doing very sussy and dark things on the down low, in the dark where no one can see them. And I think they're trying to destroy the universe itself from the inside out. The history fictionologists, very dangerous. I'd like to encounter one in the future and potentially beat one up because they're in the wrong and they are a threat. The Riddlers, Enigmata. You know what I know and you don't say what I don't say. What am I? Riddler, Baden, 
Bababalo Bala. Say that five times fast. Edding Mata has a large number of followers, with the Riddlers being a prominent group. There were once palace hall poets, chiaroscuro painters, masters of disguise, or occult monks. While having reached great heights in their respective fields, after coming into contact with the Aeons, they turned into an incomprehensible group of people who spouted ridiculousness and wrote falsehoods. Where the history fictionologists are devoted to the mystification of history, the Riddlers are obsessed with destroying the certainty of language. Words used to express meaning are gradually obfuscated in the mouths of the Riddlers. They deconstruct texts, abuse metaphors, change word orders, tamper with semantics, and transform an otherwise precise language into something beyond recognition. While the Riddlers are not as prominent as history fictionologists, their actions still have a subtle yet huge impact on the current universe. Why is it so hard to find a pure and precise language in the cosmos these days? That is another riddle left by the Riddlers. So for these Riddlers to obfuscate and confuse text and history itself, they're also pretty dangerous in not letting us be well informed of what happened in history. This is literally a universal crime and this should not go unnoticed. They love to deliberately confuse everyone and what isn't very easily understood when it comes to text, metaphor, word order, semantic, or a language into something beyond recognition, that's really dark and confusing. And even if you catch one of these Riddlers, I don't think they'd talk. Imagine them being the creator of certain puzzles or mazes or riddles that you can never figure out. That would be insane. Any history fictionologist? Absolutely insane. I'd say they're probably the most evil out of all of these factions here. And last but not least, the Arbitrators of Who the Equilibrium. Good medicine tastes bitter, sweet honey causes harm, balance begets choice, and choice breeds freedom. From life is too short. At the beginning of life, the weight of existence was placed upon the scales and the burgeoning of life energy instantly tilted the balance of the universe. But the patience of equilibrium is unfathomable. Given enough time, existence and nothingness are destined to attain perfect balance once more, and the balance of universal precepts must be respected. The arbitrators admired Hu's ideas, praising their eternal focus and patience, but universal laws have no control over time and space, and mortals can only pursue the beauty of equilibrium in a secular world by the elimination of radical extremes. Beauty and ugliness, joy and sorrow, good and evil, love and hatred. Countless opposing concepts were created and interpreted to satisfy the arbitrator's obsession with a zero-sum universe. But the rules of mortals are always riddled with flaws. Out of desperation, the arbitrators were constantly forced over the inexorable passage of time to patch up past fallacies and mistakes, however shifting the hopes of equilibrium onto the next patch. Quote unquote. Who watches on in silence, knowing that the restoration of order could never be shaken in the slightest by such vulgar mortal drama? I like to think the arbitrators, or who is like the most balanced out of all of these factions, you know, maintaining beauty and ugliness, joy and sorrow, good and evil, love and hatred. Hmm. I don't really understand the arbitrators or who the equilibrium based off of this passage. So the arbitrators follow the equilibrium in the sense of just maintaining balance in the universe, no matter the emotion or philosophy. That's what I'm getting from this faction here. But uh, that was it. That was all of the factions in the data bank. That was quite a lot from Astral Express, understanding the factions that follow every single Aeon that we know of so far. Like history fictionologists, Riddlers are really dangerous, Masked Fools and Morning Actors is night and day kind of situation, Cremators and Garden of Recollection, they're weird, Family is nice, Antimatter Legion and Annihilation Gang, Doctors of a Chaos and Device IX, they're weird too, and then Astro Express, Nameless, also very nice. But anyway, like learning about all these factions at least gives me some background context on who I'm going to meet in the future, not only on Pinaconi but also onward, even after the Pinaconi arc. But yeah, if you guys have any suggestions, any comments, anything that I misunderstood, leave them down in the comments I'm open to suggestions. If you guys have any insight or answers based off of this faction or any of these Aeons that I probably have misunderstood, leave that down in the comments. I'm open to like different perspectives and suggestions about what you guys think about all these factions. This was an extremely long recording. I assume it's going to be an extremely long video as well. Next episode we're going to go over terms and it's kind of long as well having 24 but not as big as 27 but right after we go over terms I'm going to start Pin and Coney content so hopefully you guys stick around for that. If you guys enjoyed this content leave a like on the video and subscribe to the channel. Would really appreciate the support and as always thank you guys so much for watching. Stay safe and stay awesome. Have a good one.